Hi there. I am Saptarshi Bandopadhyay, a robotics technologist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab in California. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about the Lunar Crater Radio Telescope on the far side of the moon. This project has been made possible thanks to an incredible team shown here. Now I invite you to delve deeper into this concept. The atmospheric absorption figure shows which wavelengths are scattered, reflected and absorbed by the atmosphere and which wavelengths are allowed to pass through. We see that wavelengths longer than 10 meters cannot be observed from Earth because they are scattered and reflected by the ionosphere. Even Earth orbiting satellite cannot observe in this band because of Earth-based noises. Hence, the wavelengths longer than 10 meters have not been explored by humans till date. LCRT will observe the universe in the 10 to 100 meter wavelength band, that is 3 to 30 megahertz frequency band. Moreover, since LCRT is on the far side of the moon, the moon acts as a physical shield that isolates LCRT from radio interference from Earth-based sources, ionosphere, Earth-orbiting satellites, and sun's radio emission during the lunar night. The largest field aperture telescopes on Earth are the former Arisova Observatory with 305 meter diameter and the FAST telescope with 500 meter diameter. LCRT with 1 kilometer diameter will be the largest field aperture telescope in the solar system. Of course, the idea of building an Arecibo type telescope on the moon has been around since the 1950s. Here is an illustration from 1984 showing such a telescope concept. But specific technical challenges were identified that made an Arecibo type telescope on the moon infeasible. They said that selection of an existing lunar crater on the far side, design of thermal strain compensation to survive large temperature fluctuations from 100 degrees centigrade to minus 173 degrees centigrade over a lunar day, and rim to floor transportation are too difficult. Moreover, Arecibo type foundational elements, support structures, and restraint anchors are too heavy. We show that these challenges can be overcome with LCRT. This is a top view of LCRT concept. We deploy a wire mesh of 1 km diameter in a 3 to 5 km crater. We suspend a receiver antenna feed system at the center of this wire mesh. This is a side view of the LCRT concept, showing the deployed wire mesh and receiver antenna feed system within the crater. This LCRT image was selected by the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society as the cover image for their special issue on astronomy from the moon the next decade. In the next few slides, let me show you the conceptual design of LCRT. We first dive deeper into the science objectives of LCRT. The evolution of the universe from the Big Bang in the left to the present day on the right is shown here. The cosmic microwave background radiation is being studied by Kowe, WMAP and Planck. Hubble and James Webb Space Telescope will be observing the early galaxies. Several ground-based observatories are also observing in this region. But currently, there is no data about the dark ages, cosmic dawn, and reionization phases of the evolution of the universe. Moreover, the region of the universe that we have been able to observe has resulted in a number of Nobel Prizes and Goober Prizes in cosmology. LCRT will fill this gap in the data. Note that there are a number of other mission concepts also under study. These include sparse dipole array concepts like far side and satellite constellations around the moon or at Earth Moon Lagrangian point like DARE and ALFAR. LCRT will observe the spatial structure and fluctuations of the highly redshifted 21 cm neutral hydrogen line. During the dark ages, the universe was pretty simple, consisting mainly of neutral hydrogen, photons and dark matter. Because of cosmological redshift, this 21 cm signal from the dark ages is currently visible in the ultra-long radio wavelengths like 10 meters or more. The image on the right shows our best understanding on the 21 cm line as a function of the cosmological redshift or frequency. Going towards the left in this plot means going further back in time. The signals from the dark ages and the first stars are supposed to arrive at different frequencies as shown in this plot. The dotted line is the best theoretical cosmological model of the early universe without any astronomical sources like stars or galaxies. Recent measurements using the EDGES instrument in Australia have constrained the signal from the first stars. Different cosmological models have been proposed to account for these measurements, but there are large variations in the prediction of the signal strike from the dark ages among these models. LCIT will collect data about dark ages to further improve these cosmological models. The 21 cm line allows us to track the evolution of the universe at different redshifts. It sits in contrast with the cosmic microwave background radiation, which is essentially a measurement at a single redshift. We hope that LCRT's data will help constrain or bound our understanding of fundamental aspects of the universe, like the state of the intergalactic medium, large scale structures during the formation of first stars, dark matter physics, and inflation. The biggest challenge in collecting this data is the galactic foreground radiation emitted by our own Milky Way galaxy. This foreground is five orders of magnitude stronger than the dark ages signal at the LCRT band. But we know the spatial structure, spectral shape and polarization of the galactic foreground signal. We will use these properties in order to separate the strong galactic foreground signal from the weak dark ages signal. 
The figure at the bottom shows the galactic foreground signal in the galactic reference plane. The lines show the region of the sky that LCRT would see if it were located at different latitudes on the moon. We would like to avoid the strong signals from the center of the Milky Way galaxy. This table shows LCRT's key parameters. The longitude of LCRT's location should be within 180 plus minus 45 degrees to avoid RFI from Earth as shown in the top right image. We plan to use a stationary parabolic feed to avoid moving parts in LCRT's receiver. We plan to carry out observations in the lunar night to take advantage of the smaller temperature changes. LCRT will have an operational life of at least one year to collect sufficient science data as shown by the integration time curves at bottom right. We now focus on finding existing lunar craters on the far side of the moon. Thanks to a lunar reconnaissance orbiter mission, we now have high resolution imagery of the moon. In the LROC database, there are over 82,000 craters in the 3 to 5 kilometer diameter range that are excellent candidate craters for LCRT. During NIAC phase 1, we selected the best lunar craters for LCRT. This slide shows some of the crater requirements we focused on, like location, depth, diameter, and interesting requirements like avoiding boulders or outcrops in the crater, a complete crater rim, and level surface inside the crater to help with LCRT's construction. We manually surveyed 50 craters and selected this crater. Note the large depth to diameter ratio of 0.25, which helps with suspending both the mesh and the feed inside the crater. Now let us discuss the wire mesh design. We use a parabolic reflector mesh with the receiver feed system at the focus of this reflector. Since both the wire mesh and the receiver antenna feed system are suspended inside the crater, we did not need Arecibo type heavy foundational elements and support structures. Moreover, lunar gravity is one sixth that of Earth gravity, so lifting this heavy mesh should be less of a problem on the moon. The wire mesh design on the bottom left ensures that the minimum wire spacing is less than 2.5 meters. This is an important science requirement that enables the mesh to work like a perfect reflector. Since ultra-long 10 meter radio waves cannot see these giant 2.5 meter cross 2.5 meter holes in the mesh. Thankfully, this makes the LCRT mesh significantly lighter. The wire mesh is composed of radial wires that run radially from the central lander and circumferential wires, small lightweight wires that electrically connect neighboring radial wires. The radial wires are the main load-bearing wires that determine the shape of the reflecting dish. We all know that if we held two ends of a uniform string, then it would take on a catenary shape. But if we use a variable mass string where the linear density is proportional to 1 by cos square theta, then the string would take on a circular shape as shown in this experimental validation. Using this innovation, the thickness of the radial wires and the circumferential wires are designed such that the shape of the freely hanging wire mesh conforms to the desired parabolic shape. The equations are described in this slide. Note that the wire thickness varies from 1 to 2 millimeters. Since the linear density changes uniformly due to temperature changes, the wire mesh passively maintains its shape across large thermal fluctuations from 100 degrees centigrade to minus 173 degrees centigrade over a lunar day. This is a view of the actual 1 km diameter parabolic mesh for LCRT. This zoomed in view shows that the components in the mesh span 6 orders of magnitude. The diameter is 1 km, while the diameter of each wire is approximately 1 mm. Therefore, designing and analyzing such a mesh is a computational challenge. During NIAC phase 2, we are designing the reflector wire mesh to satisfy the following interdisciplinary constraints. Structural analysis to prove that the stored mesh will survive launch. Analysis to show that the 1 km diameter mesh will deploy properly from the stored configuration. Structural and thermal analysis to prove that the deployed mesh will survive lunar loads and temperature changes. RF analysis of the mesh to understand its RF performance. We might use a GMRT style rib structure for LCRT's mesh as shown on the right. We will discuss these interdisciplinary constraints in detail in the following slides. In NIAC phase 1, we developed this FEM simulation framework. We first designed our challenging mesh in MATLAB and then exported the mesh to Python and Abacus where FEM analysis is performed. Here we show the same 100 meter diameter model in MATLAB and Abacus. For structural analysis, we use the beam elements and joint connection shown here. This image shows the deflections in the 50 meter diameter mesh scaled by 50 under lunar gravity and thermal loads. The deflection is within bounds and the parabolic shape is maintained. As stated previously, LCRT observes during the lunar night when the temperature changes only 10 Kelvin or 10 degrees Celsius. We also use the appropriate th coefficient of thermal expansion for aluminum in these temperatures. A key variable is the number of lift wires required to suspend the mesh and receiver feed system. Assuming each wire and anchor can handle up to 1000 newtons of tension, we chose 16 lift wires for the 2000 kg mesh, 4 lift wires for the 40 kg receiver system. The geometric calculation and strain studies are shown in this slide. 
This image shows the deflection of a 50 meter diameter mesh scaled by 4 under lunar gravity and thermal loads and supported by 16 lift wires. These deflections are within bounds and the parabolic shape is maintained. During NIAC phase 2, these simulations will be gradually extended to the 1 km diameter mesh scenario. Next, we focus on the RF performance of the reflector mesh. The top row of figures shows the radiation pattern of the mesh over different frequencies from 3 MHz to 30 MHz. The table compares 1 meter and 2 meter wire spacing in the mesh with ideal reflector performance. Of course, larger wire spacing leads to poorer RF performance, but the mesh has a smaller mass. Understanding these trade-offs is an important focus of the work in NIAC phase 2. We will be using a log periodic antenna for the receiver feed system. Here we show the design of such an antenna and the gain patterns at different frequencies. During NIAC phase 2, we will reduce its size and improve its spectral resolution. We now discuss the concept of operations. We plan to travel in a single launch from Earth to the far side of the moon. Before landing, the spacecraft separates into two parts. One half carrying the reflector mesh and the receiver antenna lands in the crater floor. Another half carrying some dual-axel rovers, power and communication equipment lands on the crater rim. The six steps in the corn ops are shown and will be discussed in the following slides. The Duaxel rovers are specifically designed for climbing up and down steep terrain on the moon. They are currently under active development at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. This video shows the Duaxel rover climbing up and down steep terrain during field test in the Mojave Desert. This slide shows four CONOPS options that we are studying in phase two. The three options in the right involve using different number of rovers. They represent a trade-off between the construction or deployment time and the cost of the mission. The option on the left involves shooting harpoons into the walls of the crater. This option does not need rovers and the extra spacecraft at the crater rim, which leads to massive cost savings. But this is a riskier alternative with lower TRL technologies. In order to better understand the number of duaxial robots necessary for construction, we pose the minimum time assembly problem as a mixed integer linear program optimization problem. We use realistic travel times for the rovers that depend on the lighting conditions in the crater, terrain, and the loads they are carrying. Obviously, increasing the number of robots reduces construction time. Let us now discuss the different steps in the CONOPS for deploying the reflector mesh and the receiver antenna feed system. They are packaging the reflector, deploying the left wires, anchoring the left wires, and lifting and deploying the reflector mesh and the receiver feed system. We made a large list of possible options so that we can understand the pros and cons of different approaches and then select the best approach at the end of phase two. To package and store the one kilometer diameter reflector mesh, we have the three options shown here. We selected the origami based approach because it allows us to ensure the structural integrity of the reflector during storage and deployment. Origami based approaches have been full in space, but nothing of this scale has ever been built. For deploying lift wires, we considered both single and multi-agent options that involve both the lander and duaxial robots. In the top-down approach, the spacecraft first deploys the guide wires and then lands on the crater floor. The bottom-up approach is initiated after the spacecraft lands on the crater floor. Our favorite concept is the hybrid tethered robot concept where the duaxial robots go into the crater and retrieve guide wires from the spacecraft lander. Tethered rovers serving as anchors or carrying passive anchors are deployed around the rim. These rovers descend and link up the lift wires in the lander at the crater floor and climb back to the crater rim. 
This approach reduces mission risk and allows for on-the-fly reconfiguration. For this, we plan to use the duaxial rovers and the assembly scheduler discussed previously. The lunar regolith is glassy and angular and would tear apart the left wires or rovers tether if they drag on the lunar surface. In order to reduce dragging, we prefer a dual spool system as shown in the right column. We could reel both the wires from the rover so that the wires on the lunar surface are not moving. We are currently investigating a number of anchoring mechanisms shown in this slide. Of course, using the ground-based rovers as anchors provides the most opportunities, but it is also a costly option. Here are some anchoring options for the lift wires that we are currently investigating. At the end of NIAC phase 2, we will select our preferred option for anchoring the lift wires based on ease of implementation, load carrying capacity, and TRL. Once the lift wires are in place and anchored at the crater rim, we will start deploying the reflector mesh and the receiver feed system. We will use a simple pulley system on each lift wire to unwrap the mesh as shown in the right column. We prefer centralized control of antenna lift and calibration functions, which minimizes the potential for lift wire damage and reduces the complexity for executing the coordinated lift of the entire one kilometer diameter reflector mesh. Some examples of wires and pulley based lifting mechanisms are shown here. We have calculated the requirements for our desired motors, which will be all housed inside the main lander. The next step is to deploy the reflector mesh using our origami approach. Imagine a rotating disc with an embedded mesh at the top of the lander. As we pull along the lift wires, the disc spins and releases constraints and the mesh unfolds and expands to its full diameter of 1 km. Here we show the Abacus FEM model to simulate and analyze the deployment process. The stored and deployed structures are shown on the right. We use beam elements and tie constraints in this model. The video on the left shows the nominal quasi-static deployment of the 75 meter diameter mesh. For the first 90% of the deployment, we apply forces along the lift wires to unwrap the mesh. This mesh is bistable. That is, after crossing 90.3% deployment, the mesh automatically unwraps itself without any external forces, as shown in the video on the right. In NIAC phase 2, we will create FEM simulations for the 1 km diameter mesh. We also perform parametric analysis to understand the effects of Young's modulus, wire thickness, and number of folds on this deployment process. Another proof of concept deployment simulation using the Merlin 2 software shows the deployment of a 1 km diameter mesh with no minor folds. This stored structure has a height of 80 meters, which is not practical, but this helps us validate the forces computed by other softwares. LCRT is a high-risk project which includes many notable firsts and superlatives. In recognition of this, we have already begun a risk list earlier than usual in the project lifecycle. This is a pictorial representation of that risk table. Thus, we plan to build and deploy a 1 km diameter parabolic reflector mesh and receiver antenna feed system in a lunar crater. To summarize, we have described the LCRT concept and the key technical challenges that we need to overcome to make this a reality. If successful, LCRT would provide groundbreaking scientific insights into the evolution of the universe by observing the universe in the poorly explored 10 to 100 meter wavelength band. LCRT would be the largest filled aperture telescope in the solar system. This has already created a lot of public excitement. Finally, I would like to thank my awesome team who are involved in this effort. You have been seeing Vladimir Vustansky's concept art throughout this presentation. Together, we are working towards making LCRT a reality someday. I want to thank you all for your time and I am happy to take questions. Please feel free to mail me your questions or comments. Thank you.